I've got some financial things coming up. Uh, one of which is a commitment to WYTJ uh, that I make every year. And uh, uh, my son is a CPA and he does my taxes, but I always get an extension for October. And uh, so they're supposed to be in the mail Monday or Tuesday to pay my taxes. And I've already had the commitment of more than enough money coming in to cover both of them. So I'm not going to have to pay anything out of my pocket uh, for either one. And uh, God does that over and over. I cannot tell you how many times he has done that for me. Okay, uh, for those of you that were not here this morning, or for those of you that were here, I want to do just a brief rehearsal of what we talked about this morning. Uh, we talked about the difference between saved and salvation. So often they're just interchanged, and, and I understand that's not a problem, but so many people are living salvation, but they've never been saved. Uh, you cannot have salvation without Christ. Saved is an instantaneous like this. Uh, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in. He seals you until the day of redemption. And from that point on, you're God's. And then that's where the salvation comes in, is the living out your salvation after you get saved. And I, I'm afraid that so many people are living the salvation life, but they've never had the saved experience. My Bible says, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And a lot of people are trying to enter their way into God's presence and God's God's pleasure through what they do uh, for, uh, for the uh, to be saved and it doesn't work that way. Uh, you get saved and then you work for the Lord. Now we talked about that this morning about the salvation. I'm not going to go in that again. But I want to cover tonight why we work so hard in our Christian life as uh, believers, having been saved and now serving God. Uh, why do we work so hard? Why is so much expected of us out of God? Well, just stop and think what He did for you. He died for you. Yeah. Without that, we'd all still be on our way to hell and split it wide open. That ought to be enough to motivate us to, to get off our stools and get out and do some work for the Lord. But we serve the Lord because in the future there's going to be a judgment. Not for to be saved, but a judgment of our salvation life for the works that we've done and how we're going to be rewarded. So let's look at a couple of verses. Romans chapter 14 verse 10 but why dost thou judge thy brother or why dost thou set at not thy brother for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ now picture eternity uh, after the rapture after the rapture takes place there will be seven years in heaven seven more years here on earth seven years in heaven three and a half three and a half the first three and a half is going to be during this period the judgment seat of Christ where all believers are going to come and stand before the Lord and give an account for what we've done not to be saved if you're not saved you won't be there but if you are saved you're going to be there there are going to be some that get well done thou good and faithful servant thou hast been faithful 
powerful over many. Uh, a few things, I'll make thee ruler over many. There are going to be some <laughs> uh, just going to be there by the skin of our teeth. We've got no fruit. We've got no uh, uh, no product to, to give to God that we can look back at. And I don't want to be on that end of the scale. I may not be on the top end over here, but I want to be a long way from the bottom end back here. Uh, and we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all, all, if you're here tonight and you claim to be saved, all, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Now, we've all got a lot of bad things in our life. And thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ that has cleansed us from a past, present, and future. Yes, even my future sins are already forgiven, but as far as eternity goes. But in my relationship with God, I don't want to let those things come between me and my Heavenly Father. And we need to for, uh, for, uh, confess and forsake those things in our life that would prevent us from being uh, what we want to be. Now there's a purpose for serving God. And at the judgment seat of Christ, there's going to be some crowns given out. And I want to look at the five crowns tonight that are going to be given. Uh, some people are going to receive all of them. Some people may not receive any of them. Well, they'll receive at least one, the crown of life, because they are saved. But as far as <coughs> getting anything based on what they did, they're not going to get much. So let's look at the five crowns. Number one is the crown of life that we get because we're saved. Um, James 1.12 Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Uh, and we need to realize that God's done his part, now we need to do our part. Not, not to ensure our salvation. That if you're saved, that's done. It can never be undone. But we can enhance our Christian life by our daily activities and faithfulness and going on. Revelation 2.10 Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. Oh yeah, believers, if you've ever read church history, you know that a lot of believers especially Baptists were cast in prison were beat at the stake were stoned were beheaded for the cause of Christ uh, once they get to heaven that didn't amount to a hill of beans and I'll tell you this, from reading the history, it didn't amount to a hill of beans when it was about to happen. Uh, I always think of um, Obadiah Holmes, after he'd been beat at the stake. He could have walked free. People offered to pay the fine, but he went to jail because he refused to pay the fine. They were going to beat him at the stake. They beat him uh, with 39 stripes. The uh, uh, thing on it had three heads on it that they beat him with. He walked away from them, and as he walked away from that kind of beating, with a smile on his face, he said, you have beat me as with a rose. Uh, I don't know that I could do that. <clears throat> Most of us can't, and we can't in the flesh. But when you're living for God and you've got the power of God in your life, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ 
that strengtheneth me. And we could if we had to. Uh, and um, um, but we're going to get the crown of life that comes for our salvation. Most of us here, we're not going to suffer any persecution or things like that. Uh, we've got the opportunity right now, and it may be coming to an end in our society, but right now we've got the freedom to live the things of God the way God intended for us to do. Uh, they've kicked us out of the school. They're trying to kick us out of government and out of the judicial system and everything else, but we need to cry out the things of God. Why? Because we have the crown of life. We're God's voice here on earth. Number two, there's an incorruptible crown. Uh, the first is the crown of life that you get because you're saved. This is the crown that you get because of the work that you do to obtain it. Not everybody's going to get it, but it's an incorruptible crown. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 9.25 and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. What God has promised us is perfect, sinless, will not be tarnished in any way, cannot be stolen. Uh, once it's given, it's there. Uh, an incorruptible crown. This is what we're working for right now. The word strive, striving for the mastery. We're striving for reward, not salvation, but it's like working. The better work you do, the more promotion you're going to get in your job. If you're the lazy guy that comes in half an hour late or, or you don't even come in at all and you don't call in, uh, you're probably never going to be a supervisor. You're never going to be elevated up. I remember when I worked at um, uh, General Motors when I was in Bible college out on the east side of Indianapolis. And there were three guys. I'm not going to tell you any details about them. One of them was very active and very uh, efficient in his job. And he moved up into a uh, uh, headquarter position. The other two worked with us out in the warehouse, and I'm telling you both of them, in the three years that I worked there, I don't think they hardly worked uh, a, day's, uh, a day, a full day in any of that time. If there's a crown given, he would get it. If, uh, another crown, they'd be denied. The uh, incorruptible crown. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own anymore? For ye are bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Why are we striving for the crown? Why are we working for the crown? Because we are God's, and we want to bring honor and glory to His name. Number three is the crown of rejoicing. The crown of rejoicing. And I think this is the crown of, for those that are soul winners. What greater thing can we rejoice about when we get to heaven than to have somebody uh, singled out? Joe, they're here because of your witness, because of your testimony. The crown of rejoicing. We rejoice right now, but we're going to get a crown for that, for soul winning. That's why we ought to be out knocking on doors, inviting our neighbors, uh, passing out tracts and uh, uh, things like that to, to get it. That's why we ought to be supporting our missionaries all around the world. Do you realize every 
every dollar that you put in the mission's budget, you're getting a little bit of reward all around this world of missionaries that are winning people to the Lord. And when we stand that day at the judgment seat of Christ, the books are going to be open. There's a book of memory uh, that God has. And He's going to open that book and, and uh, everything that we've done. It'll be a perfect book. There'll be no errors. There'll be no misspellings. Uh, there'll be no uh, missing pages. Uh, and we're going to be rewarded out of that. And, and there's going to be missionaries that, uh, that come before God, and, and uh, it's going to be reported. Uh, umpteen churches supported you and had a part in your missions project. No matter what country you're in, whether it's America or somewhere else, we're laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven that man cannot destroy, that rust cannot corrupt. Treasures that one day we're going to be rewarded for. And that's going to be the crown of rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 What is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? Uh, Paul wrote this to the Thessalonians and he said, you are my crown of rejoicing uh, because he was the one that helped establish the church and win the people and motivate them to keep going and to do the job that God had called them to do. And uh, then the number four crown, the crown of eternal salvation. Eternal salvation. Eternal is the key word. And when the chief shepherd, 1 Peter 5, uh, and I don't have the verse on it, but it's 1 Peter and it says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, that's Jesus, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Aren't you glad for eternal salvation that nobody can take from Even Satan can't take it from us. It's settled in heaven. He can mar it. He can discourage us. He can divert us from doing the job that God intends for us to do. But we've got that eternal salvation. And I think for those that are faithful to God, will receive those crowns. Now remember this. What are we going to do with our crowns after we get them? We're going to cast them right back at the feet of Jesus Christ. And I think that there will be a record record of the crowns that you had to give back the amount of work that you've done for Christ most of us will be lacking I hope not I want to be faithful to the end um, I don't want to give up I don't want to lay back and do nothing I'm getting older, my health is going down, I can't do what I used to do, but I'm going to do what I can do. And I can pass out tracks, I pick up a stack of them every day, and as I pass them out, I count the number I did, so that the next morning when I go out, I replenish what I've passed out the day before. Who knows, those tracks are passed out, they've got God's simple plan of salvation on it. The Romans Road, and I tell people, will you please read this? Because most people, you don't have time to really stop and confront them. And will you please read this before you go to bed tonight? It tells you how to be saved, how to know that your sins are forgiven, how to know that you're going to heaven. Who knows how many people? You may pass out a hundred or a thousand tracks, and maybe only one or two people get saved. But what if you never passed out those tracks? Those one or two people would still wind up going to hell, maybe. But because of your faithfulness, somebody came to Jesus Christ because of what you did, your financial giving, 
You're passing out of tracks. Your verbal testimony, witnessing to the things of God. Your godly living. Your godly living. You think people don't recognize that? Just look out in public. I'm disgusted at most of what I see. The way women dress and dress their little girls the same way, such an ungodly looking thing. I doubt seriously that most of them are saved. Some of them may be. If they're saved, they, they'll be saved. But I sure don't think they'll want to come up before Jesus in the outfits that they wear publicly right now. I love to see ladies out in public that are dressed like women with a dress on. Some of them are very Pentecostal looking, but I still go up and comment on to them how nice I think they look and thank them for dressing the way they do. And ladies that I see in a store or in a restaurant that are dressed so appropriately like that, I want to acknowledge it to them. I want to commend them for it. And I wish we could do that just across the board in the things of God. What it would be to make Christianity look head and shoulders above the world not so much incorporated in it, to, but to be uh, separate. Come out from among them, saith the Lord, and be ye separate. Uh, and that's what we need to do. Now, number five. Number five is the crown of righteousness. Finally safe when we're in Christ. Sinless and secure place of living. That's what the crown of righteousness is. It'll be perfect when we get to heaven. But it ought to be our desire right now to live closer and closer to the things that God wants. Towards the end of Paul's life and ministry, he said, I have fought a good fight in Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 4, 7, or right along in there. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. What day? At the judgment seat of Christ. And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. If Christ were to come right now, would you have to clear out some things out of your house, off of your phone, out of your mind, whatever things. You know what you're doing that you know would not be pleasing to God. The Holy Spirit will not let you get by with it. The Holy Spirit will prick your heart. You say, well, it hasn't bothered me. Then your heart is too hard. The Holy Spirit doesn't speak to you about the way you look, the way you dress, the way you walk, the way you talk. Then you've missed the boat on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's laid up for you. Are you even going to be deserving of it? Now, I know none of us deserve anything God gives us. But it says to them that love is appearing. He is coming. Are you looking for it? Are you anticipating? Are you preparing? Are you laying up treasure in heaven? Are you waiting for that day when the trumpet shall sound and say, Come up hither. Revelation 4.1 We'll be caught up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's about, what, one-tenth of a second uh, of the twinkling of an eye. 
And God's going to take the whole Christian realm off of this earth all at one instant. All these things you see about people being caught away out of airplanes and, and uh, just disappearing out of that, it's going to happen. But my Bible tells me that Satan is going to send the world a strong delusion so that they will believe a lie. Now, I may have told you this before, this is my thought on what might, what might take place at the rapture. Islam all around the world, up here in Plainfield, uh, a church I preach at out in California, right across the driveway, a big Islam mosque. None of us are allowed to go in there. Not even the police. Not anyone. It's private and confidential to them. My thought is this, that when the rapture takes place, and it could be any number of things, but this could happen at the same moment that the rapture takes place, Satan sends out the word to punch that little button and blow this world to bits, especially America and the Philippines where there's a predominant Christian activity. And they will be obliterated. Nobody that's ever heard the gospel now listen to this. No one that has ever heard the gospel will ever be converted after the rapture. They're condemned. There's multitudes around the world that have never heard the name of Jesus. And they'll be converted. They'll be evangelized during that time. But Satan will send them a strong delusion to believe a lie. And when all the Christians are gone and these countries are blown to smithereens, there's nothing that has to be explained. It was just a phenomenon of uh, uh, war atomic explosion. I want to be gone at that time. Amen. I don't want to still be here. And if you're here tonight and you've not been uh, saved yet, tonight would be a good night to turn your heart and life over to Jesus Christ. So that if he came tomorrow morning, there'd be no doubt in his mind or your mind that you've been saved and you'll be caught up together with him in the heaven to live with the Lord for eternity. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, you know my heart, and I would want every single person in here to be saved and know that they have eternal life. But more than that, I would want every single one to make preparations right now tonight to live out their salvation until the Lord comes or until death takes us. God, help us to be faithful. Help us to be a witness. Help us to think about our testimony and what people see in us. Do we get angry and, and bitter and, and so on? Or are we kind and gentle like Christ was? There's times to be... Uh, 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 come out strong just like Jesus did but in general dealing with people love goes a lot farther than hate God help us to love <coughs> a lost and dying world to bring them to Christ and receive eternal life and help them to start preparing for all of these crowns 
that's available to every one of us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.